or two others coming in. Hello everyone, uh, everyone all right? Yes. Oh, yes. Fantastic. This is kind of quite a novel crowd. Who here has been here before? Ah, oh, so most of you are kind of new people, wonderful. So welcome to Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon. Uh, it's kind of wonky tonk talk tent of kind of multi-dimensional proportions, looking at everything from kind of anarchy and shamanism and liberty and psychedelics and shamanism, more shamanism, like shamanism, and <laughs> all good things anyway. So um, we've been going for about eight years, I just realised, on the way here, which seems like a very long time. And we meet every last Tuesday of the month, more or less, and uh, we've got a few other speakers lined up for coming sessions. So next month we have Chiara Baldini talking about the Bacantes and the Dionysian cults of ancient Greece, all that good juicy stuff. The uh, month after that, what's that? March, we must have Nina Lyon, who's an author. She's written a book on magic mushrooms, and she's also just got a new book out on the Green Man. Uh, she'll be talking about that. Then, hmm, what are we, April? We've got Jeremy Narby. Has anyone heard of Jeremy oh, Narby? Wow. Yeah. yeah, so he's an uh, author of a great book called The Cosmic Serpent uh, DNA and the Origins of Knowledge. He's coming to give a talk then. Oh, and then, there's, I think it's uh, May. Uh, we have uh, Frederic uh, Nicole Fischer, who's talking about her work. She's a, an underground MDMA PTSD. There's a lot of acronyms, isn't it? Uh, she uses ecstasy to help people with kind of <coughs> post-traumatic trauma. Post-traumatic trauma? Post-traumatic stress yes. disorder, yeah. Um, although she did get sent to prison for it. She's uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and she's since uh, got out of prison, obviously, because she's come to this talk. I'm broken her out. And, uh, she's now a medical doctor. But she's no longer able to do the therapy. Um, but she is, is going to come and talk about that. Um, who knows what's going to happen in June. We haven't got that far yet. But uh, tonight's speaker, uh, pleasure of inviting Lucy along. She also spoke at one of the other things I co-organised, which is called Breaking Conventions, a psychedelic conference we put on every two years. And Lucy's spoken at two of those events and got really kind of amazing feedback on Lucy's talks uh, last time. So uh, decided to invite her along for this. Um, it's not my class, this one's Nick my man. Uh, so, <laughs> so Lucy's a, a writer and researcher. Her first book is Approaching Chaos, Could an Ancient Archetype Save the 21st Century? And she just told me she's working on another book, maybe she'll tell us some more about that. And her talk tonight is on psychedelics, cities, and a question of origin. So please join me in welcoming Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I owe it to you to do this talk because um, <laughs> I don't think in the two years running I've done a talk at Breaking Bridge and ever actually knew what I talked about. So. I didn't get a chance to go. <laughs> so, I wanted you to know what the actual material was. Anyway, psychedelics, cities and a question of origins. Now we, we assume that cities evolved out of a farming experiment at the end of the Ice Age about 7,000 years ago. But what if that isn't so? What if the whole concept of civilization is actually the result of secret psychedelic experiences of an elite priesthood who use certain substances the astral plane and download the basic principles of cities. This talk will explore the evidence for suggesting that it is time for shamanism, for that is what I'm talking about, to come out of the jungle and be acknowledged in its true context as a sophisticated stimulus for the original ancient cities. In general, when we talk about civilization, this is where people usually start. I start with Greeks and Romans. We credit them with civilising influences of sanitation, legal structures, medicine, philosophy, mathematics and so on. But it doesn't take much genius to work out, however, that the Romans in particular learnt much of what they knew about civilization from the people who were already on the River Tiber around 700 BC, when the Latin speakers first rocked up, the Etruscans. These are the people who taught the Romans everything that they knew about how to live in cities and built their early temples for them. But where did they come from? Geneticist Steve Jones has identified genetic links with the Petunian Etruscans with the Phoenicians, who had close links with the Egyptians. 
And what is clear is that all of these people, Etruscans, Phoenicians, Egyptians, have much in common with the cities of the Indus Valley. And whilst Egyptian civilization goes back to at least 3100 BC, the much older cities of Sumer in southern Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia, date back even further to 5500 BC and to a hole in the ground. Now this hole in the ground measured about 12 foot by 15 foot, not much bigger than some people's bedrooms. <coughs> this is the earliest layer of temple at Eridu, which dates to about 5500 BC. And what is remarkable is the evidence that all these ancient cities, in spite of the great distances of time and space between them, shared so many common principles that it's possible to suggest that they all originate from the same archetype with the following characteristics. Now this is an archetype based on accuracy, precision, balance, design, infrastructure, organisation. Cities are surveyed, they're laid out in regular patterns. Sacred geometry is fundamental to architecture. These people were capable of engineering extraordinary feats of infrastructure involving massive blocks of stone weighing several tons, things that we cannot do today, they could do. And they use the same level of precision in the construction of a sacred building as in building an aqueduct. Indeed, fresh water was essential to life in a city. The urban drainage in the Indus Valley, for example, has been described as unparalleled in pre-classical times. After all, efficient drainage and control of sewage has to be the mark of being civilised. The Egyptians called this archetype living in Mart, living in truth, the goddess Mart having the feather of truth. And what I want to suggest is that this archetype did not evolve out of a farming experiment that began as the earth warmed up at the end of the Ice Age. Instead, I'm proposing that it was shamanically accessed and that cities were designed and built as a total concept surveyed and set out from the beginning. And later on, perhaps we might go into places like Chetahuit and Gobekli Tepe, because I'm not going to talk about those today, because these are different. These are cities. They never developed into cities. Having said all this about agriculture and so forth, it is true that there were momentous changes in agriculture that coincided with the appearance of these first cities. Something called the Secondary Products Revolution, now what this key development meant was that instead of just penning up wild animals for meat and hides, which Neolithic man had been doing for thousands of years without domesticating them, suddenly an aurok becomes a cow and can be used for milk and for milking and producing the secondary products of butter and cheese. The onager, well, they thought it would become the donkey, but it didn't actually, it just stayed an onager. Whereas the tarpan, the wild horse, that did become tameable and capable of being ridden. And curiously enough, the sheep at this point developed coats of wool. Before this point, they had coats like deer. And we have convinced ourselves that it was these changes of animals that allowed the growth of cities. But this shift of domestication was relatively instant. It wasn't evolutionary. It was, if it really was possible to domesticate wild animals simply by penning them up, why did that change not occur thousands of years earlier when Neolithic man had been doing it all that time? And how come not only did animals change shape, all animal species become reduced in size when domesticated variants arise, they also became usefully docile. There is, of course, the chance mutant gene explanation. Somehow, Stone Age man was able to spot that um, an Auroch was carrying a mutant gene that would make a useful cow. This cow, by the way, is one that I used to own on our family farm in Suffolk. But how would Stone Age man know what would make a useful cow? How did he have the benefit of hindsight? And how suspicious that the outcome was so convenient and so useful? In my view, it happened because of cities and not the other way around and I think it was deliberate. So is it really reasonable to suggest that there is a missing link between hunter-gatherers and Bronze Age city dwellers? Because the evidence suggests that the earliest Bronze Age farmers were not former hunter-gatherers who somehow adapted to environmental change. Hunter-gatherers were not used to staying in one place, they followed the herds. 
even if they did pen them up for <coughs> short periods. They were more used to killing than keeping stock alive, especially through the winter. It is an entirely different skill set becoming a livestock farmer. The earliest farmers did not switch from hunting herds to herding herds. And what supports this view is that the earliest examples of Bronze Age farming that I have been able to find always involved a settled pattern first based on pigs. And pigs, this is before they changed to herding cattle and sheep. And pigs do not travel big distances of cattle and sheep. Moreover, the archaeological evidence reveals that the origin of a city was not a randomly organised marketplace. The first evidence of its existence is what they call a shrine. And when I refer to a shrine, I am talking about a specially built chamber deep in the ground. The site at Eridu, from the excavation dating to about 2000 BC, has evidence of 17 previous layers, with the earliest one going back to 5500. <coughs> Others, such as Jaquetta Hawks, have commented that the key group of people who are involved in cities from the start are not the farmers, but the priests. So in order to shed more light on what may have been happening in Mesopotamia, I'd like to return to Egypt and ask, can we draw visual comparisons in terms of prehistoric depiction of possible shamanic activity as shown in Ice Age cave art? This is from Le Trois in France these theranthropic images of possible shamans, or the lion man, which is another ancient Ice Age icon, with more recent Egyptian deities, such as the jackal-headed Anubis, or Thoth, here with the head of the ibis. And can I also point out something that I think has generally been overlooked, and that is that Egyptian pharaohs were quite probably shamans. Because how else did they know what they knew? How did they succeed in keeping Egyptian civilization so amazingly consistent for nearly 4,000 years? Is it because they shared something in common with indigenous people, tribal shamans, anthropological curiosities, wild, elemental, and powerful? These days, any mention of shaman normally is restricted to anthropology and ethnography. It is very rare, given exception here maybe, that in academic circles, shamanism is linked to the history of civilization. And it needs to change, in my view. That is one thing I'd really like to raise your attention to, bring your attention to, David. <coughs> so how am I defining shaman? As someone who's been initiated, taught how to have out-of-body near-death experiences, so that they can journey in spirit form on behalf of a person or a community, to get answers to specific questions. And during this initiatory process, spirits will dismember the shaman, strip the flesh from his bones, put him back together, and revive him. A shaman is therefore someone who dies and is resurrected, and then learns how to travel, or astral plane, sometimes to a fixed point, such as the pole star, or descends to the underworld, the land of the dead, or ascends to the heavens, the place of the gods, and this is done by climbing the world tree, the cosmic pillar, or some other form of axis mundi, using the sacred ladder, or stairways, or flight as a bird. Common to all descriptions of shamanic activity are also the ability to fall into a trance and experience altered states of consciousness through the use of psychoactive substances or processes. And there is, after all, evidence that the Egyptians knew of certain narcotics, such as the blue lotus flower, it appears repeatedly in art depicting ritual. And we know of an interest in mandrake and possibly even opium poppies, such as the Minoan poppy goddess. But while there are many similarities between indigenous tribal shaman and city-based people like the Egyptians, in terms of shamanic practices, there are clearly differences between them and even the approach taken. The Egyptians had a particular kind of relationship with the spirit world. Based on a dynamic dialogue, this concept of cosmic sympathy, as above, so below. They knew that civilization was not a natural state for people, and they believed that by manipulating the higher metaphysical plane, human beings could affect change in the lower physical world. They also knew that they needed a special earthly representative, a higher order of shaman, who could engage the spirit world on their behalf to either re-establish the enormity of the civilization project 
or keep it on track. It was thus the role of the ruler, the pharaoh, to intercede. Even the very word pharaoh is possibly a corruption of these words, per ur, which mean exalted house or house of foundation, and relate to a place in the sacred precinct at Neked, near Neken, where part of the pharaoh's initiation may have happened under the guidance of priests known as the followers of Horus, the Shemsu Hall. And what the pharaoh was possibly preparing for here was the Heb Sed festival, a highly important festival, and perhaps the most significant event in his entire life. It only happened every 30, 40 years, about the time when he was about 30 and would be ready for initiation. And then after that, it happened every three years. It's sometimes referred to as the pharaoh's jubilee, and its purpose was to rededicate the country to civilization. It took place in purpose-built courtyards adjacent to specially constructed pyramids, which is one reason why Egypt is so littered with pyramids, because all pharaohs wanted to have a Hebset festival. Here is the example of the one at Saqqara with its Hebset festival court. That's what these buildings are at the front. And we know that it incorporated the Osirian rites, a reenactment of the death of the god Osiris, in which he is richly dismembered by his evil brother Seth, a shamanic, a shamanic description, if ever there was one. And all his body parts are scattered all over the Nile before being reassembled by his wife, Isis. Now, there were public aspects and secret aspects. Citizens came from all over Egypt to witness the public aspects, in which the pharaoh wore a special bull kilt and had to run around the courtyard. He also participated in a ritual meal called the Hetep, and after this meal, he disappeared inside the the pyramid for the secret part of the festival into the realm of Sokar. Now Sokar is interesting because of what he represents. He had a more complicated association with death than just being dead. He was part of a triple manifestation of the gods Tar, Sokar and Osiris, who represented the triple powers of animation, incarnation and restoration. Writer Rosemary Clark describes Sokar as representing the latent spiritual principle within all living things, the spirit embedded in the deepest regions of matter that await arousal. A description which implies the beginning of life rather than the end of it. And after all, what the fairy did when he entered the realm of Sakar was undergo the Wapawet opening of the mouth ceremony. And was this in order to stop him from swallowing his tongue while in trance? I mean, I just pose that as a question. And then he either lay in a sarcophagus of alabaster or granite, as you find in the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, a shaman dying and about to be resurrected, or on a special headset festival bed, covered in gold leaf. You can see Tutankhamun's gold headset festival bed in the Cairo Museum. And when he was doing this, he was attempting to unite different aspects of his soul, his car, which is represented by the upraised hands, this is an aspect of the soul which relates to auras, it relates to the uh, vehicle transmitting vitality between spiritual and material bodies. It's considered immortal and can be referred to as like a guardian angel. What we would perhaps call the soul is the bar. This is represented as a bird and it's the part of the soul which is the astral body and it needs the car in order to inhabit the body but it can leave the body, for example, while asleep and the body still remains alive. Whereas the car leaves, you're dead. All these aspects of the soul were eternal and the bearer was attempting to unite them into an arc, a shining light, a heron, which is sometimes referred to as the phoenix, which is possibly significant in that the phoenix, which is the Greek word, is associated with burning. A new phoenix arises from the ashes of the old and the connection that the Greeks clearly made with the place where all this took place inside of was a pyramid, which is a Greek word for this structure, and has at the root of it the word pyre, which means fire. Now, it is our cultural problem that we think of pyramids as linked with death and tombs. The Egyptian word for pyramid is mur, mr, which has the idea of an instrument for ascending, not a tomb. Egyptian tombs were either mud-built mastabas or places like the Valley of the Kings, which has no pyramids. And the next bit is just a bit of fun. So we have mur, Car, bar, and then this was a 2011 crop circle. <laughs> but anyway, 
Um, well, what Byrne suggests that this was part of a shamanic ritual are the pyramid texts or the coffin texts, some of which were found at Saqqara in the 19th century by Flinders Petrie, the Victorian archaeologist. Again, it is our cultural problem that we think of them as describing the journey of the dead pharaoh's soul, whereas it's more likely that they describe his soul's journey while alive, a shamanic journey. The Egyptians themselves called these texts the Book of Coming Forth by Day, not a reference to death or the Book of What's in the Duat. Dr. Jeremy Nagler, another potential speaker for you, David, an Oxford academic, has written this classic book, Shamanic Wisdom in the Pyramid Texts. And he is one of the few that has come to the conclusion that these texts are full of the kind of language found among shamans all over the world. The texts repeatedly refer to the pharaoh taking on the form of a bird, flying up. Chapter 20, for example, talks of the pharaoh rising into the sky like a mighty hawk or climbing a ladder. Another mentions a stairway to the sky which is set up for me that I may ascend on it to the sky. I ascend on the smoke of the great sensing. I fly up as a bird. Elsewhere in the same passage, the text refers to the pharaoh flying up in the form of a falcon to the imperishable northern stars. Now this is a really key phrase because the Egyptian word for these stars is the Kemi. Is this the true meaning of al Kemi? Have we been misled about alchemy? The source for the word chem in alchemy is usually given as a reference to Egypt as the black land, which doesn't make any sense in this context. It makes more sense to me that what actually means, alchemy actually means, is journey to the fixed stars, astral planning to the imperishable moon stars, the chemi. Could it be that the Greeks, through whom we know as much as we do about Egypt, got confused. They may not have been party to all the secrets. It's probable that the Greeks didn't necessarily even know about the astral plane on the Kemi, but what they may have known about was the preparation of the substance that the pharaoh consumed first. Maybe the Greeks confused an outcome with a process, and as a result, we know about the process, but are not aware of its purpose, and the process was what we call alchemy. Returning to the Hetep meal, the connection to alchemy might become even clearer. Was this meal the means by which the pharaoh brought on a trance? Is this when the blue lotus played a halcygenetic part? Even if there's no clear mention in the text of the blue lotus, there are significant references to a mysterious substance known as the solar bread. Does this image of the pharaoh in the opening of the mouth ceremony with the blue lotus on his head also include the solar bread. Here's another image of the solar bread, someone else offering it. And Jeremy Nagler describes one pyramid text um, talking about the solar bread as an enigmatic food spell. It's an utterance for the offering bread to fly up. So what was this solar bread? It clearly has special properties. And I have wondered if there are links between the solar bread and the cow goddess Hathor, who had many roles mostly to do with nurturing. She sometimes lends her cow horns to the goddess Isis when tending the infant Horus. Hathor is also the one who nurtures the soul of the pharaoh on his journey, and she had other names, like Nuta, Golden One. If we go to her temple at Dendra on the Nile, we will find the hieroglyph for gold outside on the back wall. And it's also here that there are those strange um, light bulb type reliefs in the crypt which may possibly relate to electrical processes that could have been involved in purifying gold. Even more significantly, it's at her temple at Sarawit el Khalim in the Sinai Peninsula, where in the 19th century, Flinders Petrie found vast quantities of mysterious white powder, which had no animal residue, hidden under slabs in the floor. Was this powder that Flinders Petrie discovered the solar bread? Was it also the Philosopher's Stone? Who knows? But knowing the importance of gold to the whole alchemical process bizarrely brings us back to the earlier cities in Mesopotamia. It is most striking that their own name for their land, Mesopotamia being the Greek name, was Ki N G, which translates as land where gold is king. Even though Mesopotamia had no gold reserves itself, its gold came from the aptly named gold, Golden Crescent, and I put that as a yellow line across 
of the mountainous regions. That's where the gold came from. So was the same kind of alchemical astral planing happening there too? We know from later evidence that a similar kind of ritual, which involved confining the king inside a ziggurat for several days, happened in Mesopotamia in the same way that it did in Egypt. So can we extrapolate and infer that this shamanic style activity was responsible for the very beginning of cities as we know them? Is that what was happening in that hole in the ground in Eridu, 5500 BC? And what is perhaps even more significant and re relevant today than the question of origins was the agent's ability to restart civilization after major catastrophes. We are possibly entering a period of enormous earth changes now on a similar scale to those that they may have experienced before. And what I'm talking about in particular is a major catastrophe that happened at about 3100 BC. It's around the time of the start of the Mayan Long Count calendar. And this particular catastrophe had irreversible ecological changes. Quite literally, forests turned to desert. Places like the Gobi, the Thar, and the Sahara went from being lush and green to sand. That's how serious it was. And the consequence for people is that they moved. This was the time of the big migrations. Nearly everybody left their homelands in search of safer places. And what is noticeable is that the city concepts transferred in their entirety over significant distances. There was no incremental distribution from Mesopotamia of cities. Civilization jumped from Mesopotamia to Egypt, to the Indus Valley, to Lebanon, to Minoan and Crete, to the Etruscans, because the civilizers were seafarers and had knowledge of longitude as well as latitude. And returning to Egypt is my example which then stayed, as I've already said, amazingly consistent for nearly 4,000 years. Egypt could become, then, the temple of the world, something that is so lacking now. And I'm thinking back to the extraordinary comments that Daniel Pinchbeck was making at Breaking Convention earlier today, earlier this year, rather, about how the higher order entities are very distressed at the fact that we no longer show reverence. And this is what is so missing in our, in our unbalanced world. So how did they know how to re-establish civilization? No computers, no great libraries. This is long before the Great Library of Alexandria. The technique for accessing knowledge was, in my opinion, through shamanism, through the ritual use of substances for out-of-body experiences, techniques that can only be used for peaceful purposes by people who have self-mastery, who have been initiated, trained in their use, people who can face their demons and know how to navigate in worlds beyond ours techniques that are still available to us today. So we have a choice. We can either continue with our Iron Age disrespect, or we can reconnect with the ancient archetype. They knew it was all interconnected, that there is no Cartesian split, no difference between subject and objective. Quantum physics shows that, that at sub-molecular level, there's no distinction between those two. Ends and means are also the same. How you do something is as important as why you do it and linking psychedelics and alchemy to ecology, cosmos and consciousness is our route to a higher order of civilization than we currently experience. It has been done before and can be done again. Thank you. Well, that was not faster than I thought. Sorry. <laughs> I thought, I thought T's talking too quickly. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You can hear me. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> so, um, we'll have time for questions and comments. Questions are better than comments are right. I'm going to give a comment, actually. So, I'll take my kind of speaker's prerogative. Oh, sorry. My host's prerogative, and that's the first question. Oh, there is a comment. But it's like, I'm fascinated to see that you've talked about the Mer Karl Bar, the Mer Karl Bar. I picked up on this ages ago, but I never heard anybody else say it, which is kind of really. Uh, Really, but I kind of went a bit further. I, I came up with that maybe even the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah came out of this as well, yeah, the Kabbalah, yeah, Bar, yeah. Love. Yeah. And also it kind of relates to the kind of the more yoga Hindu system yeah. in India as well, because they have this, um, you know, about Shiva and Shakti. Okay. We're going into a bit of a rant here, but you know, so uh, in the way that it's pronounced in kind of Sanskrit, you know, the B and the B have no difference, so it's Shiva 
and you would say, you know, Shiva, Shiva is the same thing. And Shakti is also known as Shakka, so it's like you get a Ka and the Ba there as well. And of course, you have this Merkaba as well, which is the union of the, the Ka and the Ba, mm -hmm. which is this kind of central thing. And there's a, there's the two upside down pyramids. Exactly, yeah. That's where the crop circles are. Absolutely, yeah. And so they say, you know, Shiva without Shakti, or Sh Shiva without Shakka, Ba without Ka is a Shaba, which is a corpse, Shaba without Ba. Okay, so it's like, a, we also have these other words for kadava, which is like a corpse, kadava, okay. which is like the car without the bar. Mm -hmm. And so the kabbalah is like the union of the car and the bar. It's like bringing the kind of the material into the spiritual and the spiritual into the material. So I think kind of this, this etymology of the car and the bar kind of extends all the way across to India, as far as I'm concerned. It's very speculative. But anyway, that's a comment really, rather than a question, but I'll throw it out there. So. So what, well, what I'd like to know is if, if what I've just said made sense to people. Did, did it make sense to you? Did, yeah. it, did it resonate? Yeah. Yes. Interesting. So we'll, we'll open up for questions. Yeah, okay. Who's going to, who has the first question from the floor? Come on, don't be shy. Um, you mentioned something about um, like the earth had a sort of wave that uh, created the perfect conditions for the, the civilization to continue. Do you think that that detachment from the earth is also part of a different wave that had another goal, another intention that is, is somehow coming back to like, you know, you detach and then you come back to where you, you, you started? That, that's a bit of a tricky one because, I mean, that, that major catastrophe that I mentioned at the very end, that was like the end of the perfect time. The Holocene perfect time, the climactic optimum in 3100 BC. And they still managed to restart civilization then. So there, there are lots of reasons why civilization kind of went off course. I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but our Indo European ancestors had a lot to answer for there, and, and why Egypt kind of petered out and came to an end after 4,000 years. So, I mean, there's also the Kali Yuga, the, the, the big cycles, you know, are we just coming out of the Kali Yuga now? And then that was seen as a very destructive time, I think it's supposed to last 2,000 years or something, whatever. But I mean, so we are possibly moving into a new consciousness era, it's true, but it will have painful start, and I think we're seeing that, definitely. But that's why this ancient archetype, in my view, is so, is so important, because it shows what could be done and how... Because what interested me about it was that these people who created, who lived by this archetype, I shouldn't say created, lived by it, they could live in great comfort, great sophistication, and still be in harmony. That's the, it's the lack of harmony that we have. We think of ourselves as civilised, but I think we're actually in a shadow civilization. We lack harmony. We don't have, know how to live in harmony with the earth. Whereas these these people with the archetype, they definitely they definitely need that. More comments on the floor. Yeah. You mentioned your Becky Tepe. How yes. do you think that fits in with this? Yeah. Well, as I was saying to you earlier, um, my problem with I haven't totally personally um, completely absorbed Gobekli Tepe, and it's also Chattahui as well. Um, they, they don't develop into cities, those amazingly ancient places. I think there's some extraordinary parallels between Gobekli Tepe and what was happening in South America. I think there's some very strong visual parallels between um, Gobekli Tepe and South America. So I don't really totally understand what the culture was that created those places. Chattahui, I was saying to you earlier, I think Chattahui was possibly some sort of outpost that was part of civilised people. I, I think that there's some very strange anomalies to do in Chattahui. I don't know if any of you, am I speaking in tongues? I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I've got to be taken, but... Oh right, well Chattahui was, has been, a, it's been known for a lot longer. It's also in Turkey, um, it's on the Konya Plain, it's a bit further south. Um, How do you spell it? Sorry? How do you spell it? Uh, Chattahui. You spell it C, it's a soft C because it's um, Turkish. You spell it C A T A L. Um, and then a H A, can't remember how you spell the rest of it, Hoyuk. It's two words basically. Um, 
But the point about Chatahoyak is it, it's all very well laid out, and but the thing there that's anomalous is that the, there's a great emphasis on the storerooms, which are better built than the housing, which suggests to me that the elite created it and they used the indigenous people to run it because what's been found at Chatahoyak are something like 10,000 little tokens of pressed clay, and they say it's the beginning of money, and I don't think so. I think it's the beginning of accountancy. It's like a really easy bean counting process. And there are a series of these, um, a series of, of these are like emporia, they, uh, and they go all the way up from, um, where are we? Is it on? They go... Oh, pointing it the wrong way around. Oh, um, so that will help. <laughs> it's on your yeah. cunt. Um, where are we, Turkey? Um, that's probably the wrong, wrong map. But they go all the way up, um, up, up through the, the mountainous region. And I think that they were, yeah, there's Chetahoyak. That's, that's how you spell it. <laughs> and and, and these, these settlements go all the way up to Mount Nimrod. And I, I think that they were um, like fueling posts. They, they were places where they could feed people who were then working in the mountains, extracting minerals. That's my personal view on Chatterhuic. Um Quebec and Tepe, I can't remember, it's somewhere up, up here, I think. It's, it's not quite the same area. <coughs> um, but these don't grow into cities. And the cities that start off down here, they are, they are quite distinctly different. They, they have a different kind of infrastructure, they are laid out in a different kind of way, and they are clearly very obviously uh, meant to become cities. That, that, um, uh, that picture of Eridu was a reconstruction, um, if I find it, a hole in the ground. Um, I don't know what I've done with it. Anyway, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's quite a different order of things. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah. Oh, I can jump in, actually. Do you think of questions? It was, uh, Graham Hancock was giving a talk recently uh, based on his latest book. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. I haven't read it, but I saw his talk, so <laughs> it's a bit of shorthand. But he was talking about Goblet. Black and Tepe, yeah. and how, how old is it, 13,000 years or yeah, something? Yeah, it's really very it's old. Really very old. It's it really kind of just changed the kind of date line of civilization yeah. so far. Yeah. And the idea is it was really just like temple structures, really. There was no yes. really residence there. Exactly. And it kind of supports the idea that, you know, people would, it wasn't kind of cities were the first, it was like people would congregate <laughs> for kind of spiritual purposes initially, yeah. and then the cities came after that. But what he's also saying is, it's now established that there was a massive catastrophe, like a meteorite, hit uh, somewhere in the Yucatan oh, Peninsula mm -hmm. and uh, threw this massive dust cloud, mm -hmm. it was like ginormous meteorite, and um, mm -hmm. caused this kind of widespread kind of catastrophe all over the planet. And yeah. uh, you're saying at that point, you know, all the kind of current, the civilizations that are around at that time virtually disappeared. Yes, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think, I mean, I think there have been a series of these catastrophes, and the one that happened at the end of the fourth millennium is slightly, slightly similar in, in, in that respect. Um, but again, there's it, a different quality to the Gobekli Tepe kind of culture. And I, I'm being quite precise in saying that civilization is based on cities rather than cultures. And that's why I think it's, it's so different. And it's slightly more accessible to us because we can extrapolate from Egypt. We, and Egypt is so much more obvious um, than Mesopotamia. I mean, those are just heap, heaps in the sand now. There's nothing much left of them. But we can, but we can at least get some idea. And the fact is, when you when you do these extraordinary comparisons with the Indus Valley, with Minoan and Crete, and you can see all these 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 principles that that um, yeah, they they really do all have the this this it all goes together. This this archetype, everything hangs together. It's not one thing first and then then another. No, the farm, farm animals do not come before the rest of it. They come as part of the package. This is the total blueprint, in my view. I might have another question on that. Is there any more questions from the floor? There we go. Um, um, <coughs> I'd like to live in a really interesting year where we have internet, and the internet is such a new thing. It's, what, 20 years old or something, and it's already become a massive seal of information. And we have the tools, such as smartphones and computers, to connect to it. So let's say um, a magic catastrophe uh, wiped out most uh, of like humankind at this moment. And so like the next civilization will not know anything about the internet, but it will still be there. But the internet will still will be some sort of a rumor. Do you think that the, this thing that they were connecting to by 
are using psychedelics is some sort of like database that they created. Because, for example, under the influence of psychedelic substances, I feel like I'm like you torrent and I'm downloading information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a similarity between psychedelics and tools that we use to connect to internet. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's the whole point of an archetype, isn't it? You know, it's always there. It's, it's an eternal thing. Uh, Carl, Carl Jung was very clued up about these things. You know, he, he understood a lot about archetypes. And, and that, that is my point, is that, is that, in a way, that's why these things could happen over such huge distances and such huge timescales, because you're always tapping into the same archetype if you know, if you know how to navigate, you know how to do it. And, and I think it's a technique that's still available to us. You know, I think we could we could ask for a lot of a lot of solutions to our current problems. Definitely, that's, that's my view. It, you know, I think a lot of people they have a, a feeling about the ecological crises that we're, we're looking at that they ought to all go back and live off hedgerows and forage in the in the woods and things. I don't think that's the right right response. I think the right response is to is to stay sophisticated and cultured. And, but connect, that's, that's my view. And that's what I think this archetype shows is possible. Just on, just following up on that, I'm kind of currently involved in a bit of research where we're giving kind of top level scientists, like we've got kind of CERN physicists and people like that, we're giving them LSD to see if they have any kind of creative insights. And it's been really fascinating, honestly. Like, you know, I had a guy this week who kind of was able to visualize quantum mechanical equations in kind of three dimensions and stuff, you know, which you never had before. It's, yeah. So, you know, just to kind of confirm what you were suggesting. There you go. So there is hope. Right. Yeah. Um, well, really, it's just in regards to the last gentleman's question, Mr. Hancock, I remember seeing a video where um, he was talking about um, the so-called junk DNA, you know, the loads of leftover information. I think he made the suggestion that this may be some sort of database, this sort of, I don't know how to describe it really, but yeah. Um, I don't know, have you heard of this, yeah? Um, is this... No, not particularly, but you're saying that that's the bit that could be stimulated. Well, that, that, well, that like this gentleman said, he, he, when he's under psych psychedelics, he's able to tap into some sort of da database. Um, and yeah, I don't know, it was just, just, just a thought. I just remember watching something a little while ago. And yeah, yeah, I was wondering if it was the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, there is my are you aware of uh, Rupert Sheldrake's theory of oh, Are you aware of Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphogenetic fields and morphogenetic resonance? This is it's a theory of physics that um, the universe has a memory, so that when a particular form comes into being, um, a field exists around it that makes that form more likely to happen again. Maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, something a bit like that. But so, what it might mean is that all this junk DNA might be something that is sort of, uh, as it's replicating and you're getting protein foldings and things, those are forms, and the field could exist around that, and it might explain why, uh, you know, a monkey develops a new tool building. Uh, skill on one island and another one gets it a week later on another island yeah. but this could explain this could be an actual literal explanation for for sort of the the memory of the species what did young uh, Jung call it the, yeah yeah the collective consciousness so it might be that that junk dna or some other uh, protein folding process in the human animal uh, allows us to tap into uh, a field of memory Details of exactly how they went about their processes, but maybe by having certain imagery that helps to stimulate and helps to focus, a bit like meditation and you focus on, a, on an image. I don't know. But I wonder if it's just sentimental for it's more than that. Sentimental? Yeah, it's like, oh, I see these things and they're really important to me. I'm gonna just make these well, try. Well, well the, one, the one thing I found in a very limited way is that. I find it much easier to remember stuff about Egypt because I think about Hathor, I think about her roles, I think about Thoth, I think about his roles. It, it's like it, it helps explain the world to you because you can attach these different stories or whatever to these different deities. So for me, I find it very useful, like a mnemonic, a way of memorising processes. 
Because what the Egyptians show you is they, they show you how they go in deep. You know, they don't hang back. They kind of get straight to the heart of the matter, as it were. I mean, one, one talk I'd like to do for you another time <laughs> is a building on what I talked about at Breaking Prevention this year, which is why, why we struggle with these things, because we are Indo-Europeans. And that's one reason why I think we don't really fully, totally relate to the ancient civilization, because our answer, and you know, maybe we were even genetically modified ourselves as, as Indo-Europeans. Um, it, I don't want to go into it in detail now because it's a subject to another talk, but, but it is something to bear in mind why we, we struggle emotionally and, and intellectually with some of these concepts, I think, possibly. So you think it's just a reminder? What, the, the imagery? Yeah. P possibly, and, and also helps people, because if you think about Egypt, as I said a couple of times, the thing that's so extraordinary is how consistent it is. Uh, if you go to Egypt, the, the, the oldest stuff you look at is still as fresh when it's reproduced by the, by the, by the Greek Ptolemies much later. They, they don't, the Greek Ptolemies don't quite manage to achieve quite the same standard of representation, but it's still there. And that's thousands of years. I mean, you know, we can't really kind of relate, relate to that. We're, re we're so young by comparison to that. So I think that, that they... They kept their culture very, very consistent, and so these things were, they were part of the order. They were part of that harmony thing. Everything in the right place. I think that's possibly what it relates to. Does that help, help you at all? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it helps, but I had a point uh, building up on the question just asked. Um, there was a German uh, a researcher who spent a couple of years in Malaysia with uh, in Colombia, sorry, with um, with tribes uh, that use Yahe for their civilizations, and he built a theory about how our brains have an unconscious language of symbols, mm -hmm. so sort of an alphabet, unconscious alphabet, and basically they would have um, ceremonies all together in a village for conflict resolution, for example, to keep their civilization balanced and in harmony, like you said. And the role of the shaman after that was to spread those symbols as much as possible across the village. So similarly to many mosques or churches um, and other spiritual places, um, because our brains will pick up the symbols and even if we don't consciously realize it, it activates certain, certain I don't know, for, for example, for that specific civilization, yeah. it would remind the man who agreed uh, after the conflict resolution unconsciously of certain commitments they had um, in terms of behaviors and culture and so on. Yeah, I, I, I get what you're I'm saying. I'm trying to search for it. I get what you're saying, but um, one of the things I look at in, in my book is like so, a source of writing, you know, where writing comes from. And, and hi hieroglyphs literally mean mark of priests. It, it is a highly symbolic language. But what is, so, what is so interesting to me is that our written language is coming through Latin and all the rest of it comes by the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians were traders. So the, um, the Greeks and the Romans, they didn't want a symbolic language, because when you're doing business, when you're doing trade, you don't need something that can have loads of layers of interpretation. So I, I think that's kind of really very interesting, and we, we've sort of stayed in that kind of business type way of thinking. You know, this is one of the things I was saying in the summer at Breaking Invention, how we have this very militaristic way of being, ends justify the means. We've, we've kind of transmuted it to some extent in, into business, but the warfare side of it is still very much there. That's our Indo-European past. And, and that's again, I think, another barrier to helping us un understand these, these other cultures. I think that's very, very interesting what you said about how they use the symbols, definitely. <coughs> um. I have two questions. One to that one here. If you guys actually tried any psychedelics, if you have any experiences, and if you actually tried yourself, I and mean, if you have any experiences. <laughs> that would be terrible. If I know. Uh, I imagine there's a few people here who probably tried psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> Just has it been a guess. I didn't get expelled from school. I nearly got expelled from school. Just one here and then. Um, 
Do you think that the figure behind you might have a connection to the eight-spoked wheel? I can't actually remember what cultural paradigm the eight-spoked wheel is from, is it? But is um, I well, it could it, no. well like medicine wheels and things like that. Um, th this 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 was a I, I came I came on to this in a slightly odd way. Um, it was it was um, I was on holiday in um, Samos, a Greek island of Samos, and myself and a friend were visiting a ruined temple of Hero, I think, and I was struggling with an image in my head for the book. Because this to me is fundamental, and they and the message came through. You you will be shown an image tomorrow that will help you in your book. And what we did the following day is we went to Ephesus, which is one of those early Christian sites, but it's extraordinary that amazing library and it's also Roman and and um, and everywhere you see this symbol, which is the early Christian symbol for the hero, which is <laughs> this symbol effectively, it actually divides into eight. It's like Okay, thank you. We got it. <laughs> and then I played around with it some more. And also, you get you get an, you get fascinating relationships across this this thing. Uh, other other talks I show where there are these relationships between um, cooked food and medicine, for example, farm animals and arable is an obvious one. That's agriculture, trade and communication because that's all about communication and navigation and education and all this. And the really interesting one is the government and metaphysics, because that's the king priest one. That's the Melchizedek, Melch meaning priest, and Zedok meaning king, and Melch meaning king, Zedok priest. And that's the bit that um, the Indo Europeans, they got, they got this whole image, but without the king priest bit, without the um, metaphysical side of things. So it, it just to me, my, my publisher refused to print this in my book. He said it was too contrived. <laughs> So I'm finding a new publisher sometimes. <laughs> in last June, like, with a couple of friends, we went to Norway to stay with the local Norwegians, and they were doing research on um, elemental creatures and elves from Norwegian tales. And they were like 70 years old, and they were like, they've been doing it for years. And we stayed in their like, cabin up in the mountains called Valdres. And we were like doing like, just like walking around the forest and we had a guide and she could talk to the elemental beings. Anyway, and then when we came back, one of the nights we took a good dose of LSD and we, while I was like lying down in front of the fireplace, I closed my eyes and I got into this tunnel. But uh, it's a tunnel that I always get into since I was a kid, through my imagination and then after that when I grew up to the mushrooms and I always get into this tunnel. But this time I made it to the end of the tunnel and there, I was like floating and just like flying around this city made of crystals. You sure you went on BNZ? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But what's interesting, I was tripping on it, but like what makes me really curious about it is that there are like so many people around the world that experience the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this like city made of crystals mm -hmm. or this like beings that they offer you crystals. And I was talking to them without using language. I was just like floating around. And I've been wondering all about Atlantis as well since mm -hmm. I was a kid, and I was just wondering about your opinions on Atlantis and yeah. this city that people experience under high dose of psychedelics. Indeed. Well, in, like it, I think maybe there might be a link between shamanism and getting information, uh, maybe something lost yeah. in civilization yeah. in our consciousness. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, in my book, I deliberately <laughs> avoided mentioning Atlantis because I did I did look into it because how can you not? Because um, it is very, it is very interesting. But what what I what I tried to do in my book was um, what what David didn't kind of need to explain is that um, I I grew up in the university town of Cambridge and I kind of come from a reasonably serious my my sisters are academic and you know ancestors who are academics so I understand the importance of rigor I understand the importance of evidence I understand that you've got to be able to have you've got to be able to support your arguments. And I can't find solid evidence that really supports things to do with Atlantis. It is, it is interesting, and there's no doubt about it, you know. So, so I tried to base everything that I did in my research on, on established academic work, more or less. I mean, people like Brian Hancock, but, you know, one, he's very special. Um, but otherwise, they're, they're mostly all, all um, it's all in the academic 
record my, my stuff, my, my, my research. <coughs> and um, because I think there's enough of, a, of an extraordinary story to tell. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the established information and I'm giving it a different interpretation. I'm not changing the actual evidence itself. I'm just looking at it in different ways. Because otherwise what you have is you have a lot of anomalies, you have a lot of strangenesses that academics can't really explain. And also we're very hung up on um, ideas of progress. <coughs> we, we think we're the most advanced, we think we're the most sophisticated. And I think this is nonsense. I mean, the, the past is all primitive and backward, and I think that's just not, not, not true. So I think that, um, so the, these early cities, that, that's the earliest evidence that I can find of them actually existing. But like I say, there are these very strange anomalies to do with Chapahui. And one of the things I was saying to you about um, cereals and domestication of cereals is that um, when, when they've done the research into um, the difference between wild cereals and domesticated ones, this goes back to, I think, about 8,000 BC or more, I mean, before cities. What, what they discovered is that there's a difference of a single gene between a domesticated and a wild variety. And that single gene is to do with convenience, it's not to do with taste. It's to do with the fact that the wild seed, if you imagine a barley head, it's got like little seeds attached to a central core. <coughs> in, the, in a wild seed, that, those bits it attaches to are brittle, and, they, and when it's ripe, it breaks on the wind, it scatters. So it self-seeds. What the domesticated version does is it waits. It waits to be picked. It, it's convenient like that. But the, the anomalous part of it is, is that when they run the kind of computer models and so forth, what they've discovered is that the odds of this occurring naturally are very, very low. I mean, it, it's, an, it's an incredible um, chance that you find in a field a few of these non-brittle seed heads. And they can't explain that, so they say, oh, well, women must have picked them, which I think is just complete nonsense. You know, for 30 years, women going around, hey, girls, lead that one, just pick that one. I mean, you know, it just doesn't stack up. So like, that's an anomalous thing that I think shows at least there was something more deliberate, there were some techniques involved. And this, this kind of seed does occur at Chateau, Chateau Hui, for, for example. So... So that suggests to me, and these, these amazing bean counters, um, clay tokens, the Denise, Bessin, Chirats, counted 10,000 of them, um, that, the, that these very advanced people were around, they were doing stuff, stuff was happening. Where they were actually based and where, I mean, Graham Hancock is one of those that talks about the underwater stuff, isn't he? That, that, you know, because of the sea levels have changed, and so we've lost some. I mean, he's done that diving off Japan, for example. So it, it's more than possible that there were these. Well, there was Atlantis, and that there were these much older places. I mean, some of the, some of the research has got very hung up on biblical stuff, and um, there is there is, the, in my view, the mistaken idea that um, that um, this bit. This bit here, where is it gone? Uh, anyway, um, it's the biblical error, uh, and I think that's completely wrong. I think the biblical error uh, is actually um, up at, at Haran in the north, and that, um, so, you know, people put in loads of effort looking for stuff in the Bible, but actually, it's a waste, I'm wondering if it's a waste of time. <laughs> I think there's far more interesting stories to be discovered to do with early civilization. And to do with these links, there's a huge number of links to do with gold. That golden crescent really is literally all about gold mines. In, in, in my book, I go into it in, in quite a lot of detail. Place names, actual mines, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, this whole importance of gold in the whole process is just, just extraordinary. Does that kind of help? I guess I uh, probably have uh, one last question. Whoa. So kind of sort of wrong question. Um, do you believe that shamanism coincided, or the loss of shamanism within our world coincided with the loss of kind of a fall from grace in our society um, periodically throughout a humanity's um, existence? And also, what is it that the uh, force, the energy that you're talking about that we're tapping into? Are you talking about um, collective consciousness? Are you talking about um, a, a higher being, something that we transmit something uh, Personally, I believe that shamans are the medium by which 
we can tap into the will or the um, the uh, the agenda, as it were. Uh, kind of, I put it like it sounds a bit kind of uh, harsh as uh, of mother or mother nature, as it will, the will of mother nature. And is it? Uh, do you think? Um, what are your thoughts on um, whether any kind of higher consciousness that could possibly exist within that is uh, interconnected with the vast world, whatever, whatever extent that any being that could have possibly existed uh, away from us, obviously I'm talking about aliens, blah, 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 um, that's, they, they would obviously have to be more um, conscious, uh, for instance, down a long enough timeline of our existence, um, we can only really go one way to become more um, mindful beings, more conscious beings, so that maybe the collective knowledge that we'd be tapping into is some kind of humanoid uh, consciousness, uh, maybe even the, the um, Created the bus to whatever extent, whether that's just by some kind of conscious manipulation or some kind of manipulation in the physical realm. Um, so yeah, just the gist of the question would be um, if you, what your thoughts are in terms of the the, the knowledge, the pool of knowledge that they uh, they bear and what we are tapping into, where you believe the sources. Well, I mean, one of the, one of the things you can bear in mind is that we must all have had shamans at some point. <laughs> You know that in us as human beings, we must have been indigenous <laughs> somewhere. That that's the thing that it, we we're, we're so kind of <coughs> wrapped up in the nineteenth century way of looking at, at the world, and whereas whereas we had roots at, at, at some point. So something catas catastrophic happened to us mentally, emotionally, genetically. Whatever. I don't think it was a fall from grace. I think it was possibly deliberate um, manipulation. I think that we will possibly turn into mercenaries because one of, one of the things that I talked about this this summer was the genetics in terms of our Indo-European ancestors and um, our other ancestors. And our Indo-European ancestors are our male ancestors, and our male ancestors come from. I wish I get this to work. Um, I think the batteries is gone. Oh, it's not. Oh, well, no, anyway, it is working. Well, then. Oh. And um, our, um, our male ancestors come from the Ukraine, but our female ancestors were already here in Europe during the Ice Age. That th this is this is uh, firm genetic stuff. Professor um, Brian Sykes, who uh, wrote Seven Daughters of Eve. He's an Oxford geneticist. He, he's the one that talks about the maternal DNA, unbroken lines of maternal DNA going back 17,000 years, 22,000 years. And then there's the Y chromosome, which is to do with the male line. That the, the, the female line is in Europe, but the male line is in the Ukraine. And it's the language of the male line that we speak. We don't speak the language of the female line. The female line has been, has been lost. Uh, the only, there's only one exception to this, and that's the Basque region in Europe, where they still do have the genetic connection and the language. Their word, their word for sealing is apparently roof of the cave. Um, but otherwise, we, we have lost this, and this is why, one reason why I think we so struggle with hearing Gaia, we're hearing the Earth, because we've been so disconnected for such a long time. So, Somewhere along the route, we lost our shamans. They, they were murdered in, in, in some way. We, we've been through processes for thousands of years, so it's very difficult to actually pinpoint some particular time and say, that's when it happened. And I think it was a bit like Sorcerer's Apprentice. I think that at some point, we were possibly manipulated to become mercenaries of, of, on the European. And like the, the Apprentice, it got out of control. Because the decline of Egypt is all about the Indo-Europeans um, starting to invade Egypt. It happens at the first one starts to happen around 600 BC with the Persians, they were Indo-Europeans, and then the Greeks at 333 BC with Alexander the Great, and then um, in two seconds, and then the Romans get in into Egypt, and then that really is the end of Egypt, and then they they murder the last priests at, at, at the um, Temple of Isis. And of, of Hathor, and and that and that's the end of it. So I think it's like these this way of thinking got out of control and then took over the world, and that's what we're sort of fighting with. This um, a mentality, a way of being that's not very attractive. Does that make sense to you? Yeah.
Does that explain something? Uh, anyway. I'll give you one more last question. <laughs> this guy's patiently out of turn. Um, you mentioned that we've um, come away from the female language consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Do you think we're returning to the female language consciousness as we approach the age of Aquariusness? Uh, sorry, the age of Aquarius. <laughs> Uh, uh, because I yeah. think that, that for a long time we've um, we've lived in the um, um, well, sorry, what's the opposite to estrogen again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> testosterone. Testosterone. Right. So we've lived in a testosterone-based um, consciousness for quite exactly. a few thousand years, and exactly. I feel that on the dawn of the age of Aquarius, we're going to return to um, the yeah. nurturing consciousness of female consciousness. Yeah. I think I think there is there's a very strong sense of that. It, it, it is ha happening, definitely. And without wishing to be incredibly controversial, and you might want to throw me out at this point, but it's kind of interesting to see all these reactions to the refugees in Europe and the, like, the trouble that they've had in Germany and places where you know, women haven't been terribly happy about how they're being treated. But anyway, it's, it's kind of, it, it's like it, these controversial things have brought into sharp relief how some Europeans see themselves. I don't know if that's a really important thing to say. Uh, I just want to expand again. Go go for that. that uh, um, sorry. The, the Maya stated that um, to, uh, obviously 2012 came gone and we're all still here, but <laughs> they they said that um, the 24,000 year cycle mm -hmm. of you know uh, male consciousness is almost over, isn't it? Right. So I just wanted to bring the that as well, you know, that, that, that big uh, 2012 that we were all waiting for. I think um, if we push harder, all of us, to change the consciousness of everyone, we will get to that female consciousness <laughs> quicker. Um, but I, I don't know that actually, I don't know that you're actually totally correct, because I think what's actually shifting is, if, if you're all familiar with the concept of dialectics, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the unmarxian kind of thing, I think, I think what we're possibly seeing is actually the integration of male and female, the yin yang. I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, like, because there were, there were female um, goddess cultures in Europe before the Indo-Europeans arrived and, you know, Kurgans and um, Maria Jimbutas, she, she writes about these things. You know, the, the Venus figures that, that go back thousands and thousands of years in Europe. So the, the, that female consciousness was around then and is very, very earth-centered. So I think what we're looking at now is a, is a, is a rebalancing and an integration of, of male-female. So it's about recognizing the female in you and the male in you and the me and, and that sort of thing and just being at ease, at ease with it. And not kind of yeah equilibrium because I mean I'm I'm not really kind of a massive fan of feminism you know because I think it's very divisive I'm actually much more interested in just talking to people integration. Than, in, in, in integration uh, that's a very personal view and I and I think you see that's also what to me is interesting about the ancient archetype is that because they have this balance of, of Osiris and Isis you know they balance the male and female energies in their deities you know there was not there was none of this kind of just, you know, Mars and Venus, you know, it wasn't that kind of unbalance. So yeah, we can we can we can move forwards definitely in my view. <laughs> okay, that's the Friday. That's about all we've got time for. So uh, do join me in thanking Lucy for a wonderful talk. Thank you.